Kevin, we always begin with a number. And so I wanted to begin with 1963, mm -hmm. because that was the year of the film of Mystique by Betty Friedan, who many people believe initiated in part with this book, this at that time groundbreaking radical book on feminism, the modern feminist movement. And so can you talk a little bit about who she is and why that was so important and what it did? Yeah, sure. So yeah, Betty Friedan was, I guess, one of the early members of what one would call second wave feminism. Right? Um, just to be clear, I guess the idea of waves and feminist waves is, is an American one. Right? There's lots of different feminist movements around the world, but the way the American uh, trajectory has gone has been described in waves. So first wave would have been suffragettes, would have been the women who were fighting for the vote and for equal rights uh, in the political sphere. But Betty Friedan um, and the feminine mystique was the idea that uh, it's not just about um, vote, voting rights or about um, about equal rights again uh, in the political sphere in front of the state, but it's the personal is political. You know, this is the first moment where we said, oh, actually, you know, uh, it's not public and private where the private is not political. In fact, the private is incredibly political. And the reason women are stuck at home and are housewives is because of a larger patriarchal system. That, that naturalizes women's role as housewives. Um, she named a thing that said, she called something that cannot be named, um, and it was a description of the happy housewife. And all these women were supposedly stuck at home with their children and were miserable, were just incredibly miserable. And if you've seen, I've seen Mad Men, Betty and Mad Men is based on Betty for day. That's why they called her that. Um, and she's incredibly, you know, she's miserable, She's uh, she and she can't exactly say why, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, so it kicked off this movement um, that went into kind of all spheres of life, right? To try to reformulate, challenge gender roles. So it moved from this idea of women battling to get out of the home into a much larger conversation. Precisely, exactly. Mm -hmm. So battling to get out of the, the home. And I guess the incredibly important thing to note, and which was noted later, of course, by other feminists, is that this was a white middle class movement. It was women who were middle class and had their husbands working and, and, and had brought in enough money for them to stay at home and take right. care of their children, right? This was not the case of many, many other kinds of women, working class women, women of color. And so, so it described a very particular segment of the population. But it was put forward as feminism. Right? This is to, to be liberated as a woman means to be able to go into the workplace, right? Mm -hmm. It means to be able to um, to speak as an equal with men in professional realms uh, as well as personal realms. It means to have your husband co-parent with you. It means, you know, all kinds of things like that. Um, so the this kind of, that started off and there were very di various different kinds of uh, strains of feminism in this. So there was that, which is seen as a liberal feminism. Um, so liberal feminism meaning that it was about equal rights and individual rights. Um, we need individual rights in all realms of life, right? Um, so it was women's equality within the way things were basically operating. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it was challenging gender roles, what's natural for a man or what a woman to, to do, right? Um, so there was liberal feminism, um, but there were also Marxist and socialist feminisms at that time. And did they come later? So they were kind of around the same, same time. time. Okay. Yeah, but they didn't get as much attention. Okay. Um, and they were saying also, well, yes, the housewife at home is there because um, she helps to produce surplus value for the capital. Right. So in other words, she helps to maintain her husband while the husband goes into the workplace and creates surplus value in the factory, right? Uh, works for the factory owner, creates you know, value for the factory owner. But who takes care of the worker? Well, it's the woman, the housewife at home, and she's not paid for that. So she's part of the larger capitalist cycle, but she doesn't get any, you know, any remuneration for it. So the whole capitalist system is actually dependent on the housewife at home. So, you know, there are those kinds of, of feminisms that were challenging, challenging structural inequalities and saying we need to change political economy to give liberation to women. Um, and then there were more radical feminists, um, radicals, culturalists, who um, saw men and women as radically different. Some of them saw it as when men and women as biologically different. So you might have had um, somebody like a Carol Gilligan who said, um, that their psyches are different, that women care more. This is an ethics of care. So women care, men don't care as much. If women were in power, we wouldn't have war because they care more. Um, and there were radical lesbian separatists who said, you know, we need to have a society of women, all women. You know, men, there's no place for men in here. 
Um, so that was kind of the, from the 60s to the 80s or so. It's liberating for, for some women to go into the workforce or for all the other women who had had to work, you right. know, domestics, as whatever else. Right. Um, it was liberating to get into the home, right? So there were very different sets of questions. So you had a whole movement, right, of women of color. You had the Kombahi River Collective, black women, who um, our first lady in New York, Bill de Blasio's wife, Sherman uh, McRae has uh, was a member, right, a leading member, the leading member, which is just incredible that we can have her as <laughs> first lady, as our first lady. Um, so they came along and, and said, "Hey," and Bell Hooks was amongst these. You know, was saying, "And Audrey Lord, and Audrey yeah, Lord, exactly." And um, Kimberly Crenshaw a little bit later, and um, there were some, you know, uh, there were uh, um, you know a lot of uh, Sherry Moraga, Latina feminists, and so on as well. Um, so they were saying, excuse me, you can't talk about gender. There is no such thing as woman. There are many different kinds of women. So yeah, they, when you talk about gender, you can't talk about it without talking about race and class. For instance, it's not that um, when you talk about you're a woman and you happen to be black, it's that you cannot understand one woman, one's womanhood without understanding also one's place in kind of racial hierarchies. Those two are intimately intertwined, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the ways to think about that is, is people's different experiences of, of gender discrimination, right? Um, Kimberly Crenshaw gives an example in her article about this, about intersectionality of immigrant women, for instance, going into a shelter for battered women and not being accepted, A, because they didn't have papers, and B, because they couldn't speak English. So right away, they didn't fit the category of woman, and they were therefore not allowed in, right? Um, the other kind of example of it is, is uh, black women's hesitation to speak out in case it plays into um, forms of racism against you know, the whole community, right? Right. So already black men were, were you know, stereotyped as violent. And right. so, so if you spoke about domestic violence in the home, you were undermining kind of you know, anti-racist efforts. Right, or concerns about their husband or the impact on their, their immediate family and all the rest. So sectionality is really about the way in which all of the things in your life bear down on gender and power. It's the way that, you know, if you're a Latina woman who's an immigrant, so you are a Latina, you are a woman, and you're an immigrant, and the way those things work together is unique for you than it is for exactly. Betty for them. <laughs> for Betty for Betty, exactly. Yeah, and it's to say that you there is no such thing as a woman or a man, right? Right. Because they're each always attached to other kinds of, of ways of being in the world. Before we go on further, I wanted to talk about what's the difference between gender and sex? Because we keep talking about gender. What's gender? Like, gender, is that just a natural thing? Is that the difference between men and women? What is that? Right. Yeah. Yeah, so gender and sex. Gender, I guess we want to say gender describes masculinity or femininity. But that doesn't have to be attached to a certain body, mm -hmm. to a you know a female mm -hmm. body or a male mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. um, one can wear pink and be gendered more femininely. Yeah, right? I like flow. Oh, right. <laughs> exactly. There we go. Exhibit it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so performing. I guess what we realized is that gender is not. And one of the things about feminist movement was to challenge this and say that one could, uh, one could uh, be gendered in different ways, right? So one could be a masculine woman, mm -hmm. one could be a feminine man. Mm -hmm. um, and this is all about how one chooses to live one's life, what mm -hmm. one chooses to wear, how one chooses to be, how one chooses to express oneself, one's hands, gestures, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That is a performance of gender. Mm -hmm. okay? So one would say gender is socially constructed. It's something that, that we don't we aren't born with, but that we actually create ourselves afterwards. And we learn. Oh, we learn. Exactly. That's, That's the biggest thing. There's like cultural scripts. There are things that we learn. This is how you be a woman. This is how you be a man. This right. is a gender Like feminine. piercing the ears of a one-year-old girl and putting her in a dress, right? We're already doing gender performance and assigning certain things to her. Um, regardless of what she may feel on the inside, because we don't know what that's, but I, that's our thing. Exactly, exactly. Pink, blue, whatever, you know, babies right. and so on. Yeah, that's very early gendering. Um, and then how the policing, that policing of gender lasts sort of your whole life. Right. So girls don't do this or boys do that. And so, exactly. which is one of the ways in which, I mean, as we've sort of spoken about before, it's not, nat it's, it's not necessarily natural in the way that we do it because it has to be enforced. Exactly, exactly. It has to, and I, I think in our previous conversation, we had a, you made a great point, which was that if it were so natural, why is it policed over and over? Right, it wouldn't have to be. It wouldn't have to be. It's something that we have to learn and relearn and relearn. Right. Um, no one has to police your sight. 
exactly. or your or your nose, right? right. No one has to say, well, you can't smell sour because sour doesn't exist. Well, exactly. you know what I mean? Yes, exactly. So, so this was a pretty radical to think that you know the gender is actually something formed and that it's created. And um, some feminist theorists, and like Judith Butler, would say, in fact, this is where resistance can come from. This is where we can fight back because you perform gender differently right. than what you're told to do. Right. right. You don't have to do it the way you've been told to do it. Exactly, mm -hmm. and that can be a political action. Um, so the difference with sex um, is that sex was seen to be at least so not intercourse. And not in, exactly. Sorry. So let's yeah, let's say gender, sex, and sexuality. Mm -hmm. And sex meaning like the box you ch check on the thing you're male or female right. Right? when you're when you're you know you have to say what you are. Right. Um, and it's supposed to deal with certain parts of your anatomy that you're, right. um, you know, um, male or female. So for a while, that was seen as also biologically fixed. You're born, you come out, you have a vagina, you have a penis, whatever. Those are that makes you a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. um, but that was also challenged when we realized that in fact people's bodies are not so simple, you know, and that those dichotomy, our bodies aren't kind of either male or female. Um, that in fact we can be born with all the kind of sex attributes of both. Right. Um, or you can have multiple combinations. You can have higher, you can be a woman with higher levels of testosterone. Exactly. You can be a man with lower levels. You exactly. can have a, a Y, an X, Y, Y. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a controversy that's going on right now and uh, who can compete in the Olympics, you know, mm -hmm. if you're a woman or not. Right. And they're trying to figure out what to test and they don't know what to test. Right. What defines sex? You know, we're not sure. So I guess that's, I mean, it's, it's, um, it can be disturbing. It takes the ground away from, from uh, you know, underneath our feet. But both of them are malleable, actually, sex and gender. And now sexuality, of course, has nothing to do necessarily with either of those. Any, you know, either of those either. You can be gendered uh, a certain way and have certain kind of sexual desires that don't kind of go with what you're right. supposed to have in a heteronormative way. Right, right. So there are all these different combinations of of identity and all of these different sort of Rubik's cubes of things that are playing into feminism and then all these different ways of being a feminist, exactly. right, as we've gone to. So there's a lot to play at work. So it's a little it's a little unfair, it seems to me, to have an argument about whether or not one is specifically a feminist or not, because there are so many different types of feminism, right? Sure, precisely, exactly. When I teach this class, I call it theories of feminisms, because they're, they're just, they're multiple theories and they're multiple feminisms. Um, maybe feminism is like gender, which is sand on a beach, yes. that when you're standing on a beach, it seems really permanent, you know what it is, you're walking on it, it seems firm, it has an interaction with the sea, but the minute you actually grab the sand, it slips through your fingers, you don't know what it is anymore, and that's because because in part we're chasing a thing which doesn't really exist yeah. in a firm way, right? Exactly. It's constantly being contested. Constantly being contested and remade. And remade. And that's yeah. actually a strength. It's not a weakness. I think that's a good, that would be relativist about all forms of feminism because I think that in itself. And relativist means what? Oh, they're, they're really no different. It doesn't matter what you do or what you call yourself in terms of being a feminist. As long as you're some sort of feminist, it's okay. Was um, that it? No, well, actually, it's more that all feminisms are equal in some sense. Okay, it's, it's okay, okay whatever you are. You okay. have your view, I have my view. But Understood. Yeah, I don't, I don't agree. I think we can make judgments on which ones perhaps are more effective. But as, as you pointed out earlier, what is our goal? Is it, is it simply having women in the highest echelons, uh, you know, white women, black women, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it overturning the whole system? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the point to ask is what is the goal of your feminism, right? If your feminism is to, um, mm -hmm. is just to put women you know, in power and reproduce those same hierarchies, okay, good, you've done it. Right. If your goal as a feminist is to undo all uh, that kind of uh, order that would leave some people uh, really disenfranchised and others really enfranchised, then you're not doing it well. Yeah.